Moss Isley Spaceport. You will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. We must be cautious. I just love coming here. This is the best place in the whole galaxy. Kunta, kunta solo. Yes, Greedo. As a matter of fact, I was just going to see your boss. Tell Jabba I've got the money. Wait, why the fuck did you guys turn into action figures? You were Legos a second ago. What the fuck is going on in this place? Junkies ale, matakasi kabagachisa. Jabba bowinchi koba one shiny one shabi guayabaska. Chaswayami the kuso. Yes, but this time I've got the money. I don't have it with me. Tell Jabba. Even I get bored at some times. You think I had a choice? Over my dead body. Ukleluma. Yes, I bet you have. <laughs> wow, Han definitely shot first. Ugh. Star Wars, the film that came out in 1977 and is called Star Wars still in my mind, despite the fact that George Lucas would really like to retitle it, it's still Star Wars to me because that's how I grew up watching this film. As you guys know, I'm reviewing every single Star Wars film in chronological order leading up to episode seven this December. I've finally covered the prequels, including the Clone Wars animated film, and now we're gonna talk about the original trilogy, the three films that have inspired countless individuals, countless filmmakers. Without these films, I have no idea where film would be today, so let's get right into it. And of course, if you guys have not seen Star Wars, and I know some of you haven't, this review is going to contain spoilers. You have been warned. Here's what you guys already know. Star Wars revolutionized cinema, especially science fiction cinema, but not just that all films in general. There have been countless imitations of Star Wars that are still happening today that have never lived up to what this film was able to accomplish. It was the film that dethroned 1975's Jaws financially. This film exploded in pop culture and we can still go to a store today and buy a Luke Skywalker action figure. How rare is that? You can go to a store today in the normal kids aisle, not in the collector's aisle. You know, for like the adult toys and stuff, for like collectors, like myself, you can go to the kids aisle and buy a Luke Skywalker action figure, a film that came out in the 70s. And one of the things I promised you guys was that I would talk about how this film impacted me, and I have to do that. When I saw this film on VHS tape in the early 90s. For those who remember, for those who will never forget, and for a whole new generation who will experience it for the very first time. Star Wars Trilogy. I remember being blown away by the sheer scope of this world. Not just the fact that it was a really entertaining movie and it was cool to see lasers and lightsabers and battles and heroes and princesses and villains. All that stuff was amazing. The adventure serial aspect of it that George Lucas was so aptly trying to recreate. It was that world, the galaxy far, far away. I truly wanted to believe this place existed. As a kid, I would play with all the toys and reenact the scenes. It was one of those first films I saw as a kid that inspired me to want to try to tell stories of my own. I was like a five, six year old kid writing down little short stories, had no idea what I was talking about, but you know what? I had a great time doing it. And it was one of those films that really gave me that push to try to write down some stories of my own, even as an elementary schooler. And in the opening shot of Star Wars, after the main crawl happens and we pan down and we get the sheer size and scope of the Star Destroyer as it bears down on this tiny little rebel cruiser, instantaneously in just 
one visual image, we get the sense that the Empire has a firm grip over the Rebels. We know everything in just one shot. It is such an impressive shot visually. It still makes my mouth drop today, and it explains exactly what's happening in this story within an instant. This movie also introduced us to one of the greatest villains in cinematic history, Darth Vader, the ultimate badass of all times. Within just a few seconds, you understand this guy's methodical, he's smart, he knows his shit, and he is crazy evil. And there's been a lot of discussion about this subtext in regards to the Imperials being like the Nazis, basically. They have those dome-shaped helmets that they wear. They're invading small rebel cruisers and causing people to flee everywhere. It's obvious that Lucas was definitely taking a lot of that inspiration, and he went full-on Nazi in the Indiana Jones films. And you can really feel that in the Star Wars movies, that there's this enemy force invading these small areas, just trying to take everyone out and imprison everybody. And all of these years later, I am stunned that the special effects in this movie still hold up. They will be timeless forever. There is never going to be a time where we watch Star Wars and go, those ships flying around, that's not convincing. It still feels like space. It feels like real ships. It is flawless special effects. They still hold up today, and I watched the uncut original edition of Star Wars, not the special edition. I watched the original edition, that's the footage you're seeing in this review, and it still looks great. And one of the things I really tried to do when I watched this movie was sort of put my mind on reset. I'm so used to hearing all of these sounds, the music, the sound effects, the voices, the characters, and seeing all of these things in an order that we are used to seeing them because we've all seen the movie a thousand times, or at least I have. So I tried to put my mind on reset and watch this film as if I had never seen it before, and one of the things that really struck me was it's actually extremely brilliant to open with C-3PO and R2-D2. We don't know anything about these characters. They're not human beings. What the hell are they? We learn everything about the war between the Rebels and the Imperials for like the first 20 minutes just through these robots arguing. That's an extremely clever and original way to open your movie. You're not even introduced to our main hero, Luke Skywalker, until much later. It's really cool to have opened with these two characters and to learn about this world through them. We're thrown in the middle of this situation, knowing nothing, and we're just begging for info because all of this stuff looks so cool. Now, once we are finally introduced to Luke Skywalker, many people complain about his attitude. Well, I was going to the Tashi station to pick up some power converters. This is what's called a character arc. I'm not sure if those complainers have heard about that, but <laughs> you start off with a character in one place and the movie ends with him in another. That's called a character arc. You learn more about him, he experiences something that changes him, he is altered as a human being, he is bettered as a human being, he's a more mature character by the end of the film. We start with him in a certain place and yeah, he's a little whiny brat. But that doesn't last for very long. In fact, it only really lasts for a couple scenes. And one of the most iconic scenes in the movie is Luke staring at the twin sons of Tatooine. I remember as a kid, I must have rewound that scene a lot because the VHS always skipped right at that part where you see the sons, just slightly. So I must have rewound that part a lot just to see that and hear John Williams' beautiful themes again because that always skipped right there. Speaking of John Williams' music, if I didn't mention his score and the fact that it is still to this day something people hum um, I was just humming it as I was doing the dishes. No joke, I was like It's some of the best music ever composed, not just for movies, but as music in general. I have often imagined George Lucas sitting down, watching his film for the first time with John Williams' accompanying score, and wondering what was going through his head. Because as a film, I'm sure you guys know, it was very similar to Steven Spielberg's production with John Everything went wrong. No one thought this movie was going to be good. He was constantly trying to prove himself to other people. Things were breaking. Sets weren't working out. Costumes weren't working out. The actors weren't always giving their all unless Alec Guinness was on set. Harrison Ford has said this publicly that him and Mark Hamill would kind of joke around and not take themselves as seriously unless Alec Guinness was on set. They were like, oh crap, that's Alec Guinness. Let's be careful here. So Lucas had a lot to prove and I would love to just be a fly on the wall when he was first experiencing his film with John Williams' music. Because if I was sitting there, listening to those themes accompanying my film, 
I would have tears streaming down my face. Every single scene as this movie chugs along, the movie starts to improve even more and it just keeps building. It's one of the few films in existence in which it almost seems calculated that the movie continuously gets better as it goes along, scene to scene. One of my favorite scenes in the movie is when we first meet Obi-Wan Kenobi and he takes Luke back to his house and they have this discussion about what the Force is. Obi-Wan Kenobi talks about the Clone Wars and you're like, what is that? This entire world just opens up scene to scene in this movie. And of course, the introduction to the lightsaber, which is one of the most iconic weapons of all time. And as a kid, I just wanted it to exist. But then part of me was like, wait, I don't want that to exist because if I dropped it, I could chop my whole body in half by accident. And suddenly I didn't want a lightsaber, but part of me still really did. So it was this big conflict in my mind as a kid. I was like, I really want a lightsaber. Wait, I might cut myself in half but they're so cool. Also, this original film actually had some pretty graphic parts like Luke returning to his homestead to find Uncle and Aunt Owen burned alive and you see their burned, crusty bodies. And then Luke looks away for a second and I've always loved how he just looks right back at them like, no, I'm gonna let this sink in. I'm gonna stare directly at that. He's seething with anger. He wants to do something about this. And I've always loved that moment. It's such an important character moment for Luke. It's one of his most important moments in the entire movie. It's a quick moment and not a lot of people actually give it that much credit. But when you really think about it, he's just returned home. His entire life is now over. Everything he ever knew is gone. His uncle and aunt are now burned alive right in front of him. He looks away, but then he goes, no, I'm gonna look right at that. I'm gonna look right at that. That's exactly what I don't wanna look at right now, but I'm gonna look at it. And that's one of the first moments in this movie in which his character becomes more mature. Let's talk about the Moss Eisley Cantina. Freaking brilliant, brilliant. I'm telling you, this scene, not just the music. I, oh man, the music is iconic, but seriously, the scene. Introducing Han Solo, introducing Chewie, having this entire world expand even more. It's just, I was obsessed with reenacting that scene with toys when I was a kid. Oh, and by the way, of course Han shot first. There's no debate. He shot Greedo in the fucking dick. Yes, I bet you have. Instantly, he's the coolest character ever. And by the way, he flies the Millennium Falcon. And Alec Guinness is brilliant in this entire film, but I've always loved him specifically in the cantina scene. He's really putting on those badass vibes when he's trying to get Han to fly him and Luke to the Alderaan system. You've never heard of the Millennium Falcon? Should I have? And Lucas set up our heroes seeing the Death Star for the first time so well. The hugeness of it, the impactfulness of this gigantic thing. You feel the size and weight of this thing. Look at him, he's heading for that small moon. That's no moon. It's a space station. It's too big to be a space station. Turn the ship around. Yeah. I think you're right. And all the scenes in the Death Star work so well, specifically because of these characters. The characters are so good, they propel this film along so well. They propel the action along. It's well filmed. The sets are awesome. You feel like they're actually in a world. You feel like it's a real place in space, but the characters continue to propel this film along and they're what you keep coming back multiple times for. Now we all know the original Star Wars film had a lot of production problems. There were some bloopers that are included in the film that have been there for years, like this stormtrooper smacking his head on that door. And that was actually a very severe injury. That guy had to go to the hospital. I remember the first time I saw that when I was a kid, I thought I had discovered this gigantic thing because you know, there wasn't like internet back then. There maybe was, but I didn't have it in like 1992 or 93 when I first saw this movie. And I remember going like, that stormtrooper smack his head on the door, mommy. What was that all about, dad? And to this day when Luke and Leia are blasting back and forth between the stormtroopers, I've always loved the sound the stormtrooper makes. Oh! Ah! The Stormtrooper screams are the best. The Wilhelm scream, you guys know what I'm talking about. It is so fun. If I ever get a chance to make a movie in Hollywood, I will find a place to put the Wilhelm scream. Oh! Ah! Let's talk about the lightsaber fight between Kenobi and Vader. A lot of people complain it doesn't hold up that well. Look, if you're gonna compare it to the prequels in which everything is extremely choreographed and very flashy, no, it's not the same. But so much is happening thematically here between these characters, and the dialogue and the way in which it's edited still make it very entertaining. Is it as good as Empire Strikes Back or Return of the Jedi in regards to lightsaber fights? No, but you also have to take into account the difficulties that were happening in making this movie. These people were making something they didn't entirely understand. They didn't know if they were gonna have the special effects to pull this off. They were walking on uneven ground. They didn't know what they were doing. They were hoping that maybe it would look good. And the fact that it looks as good as it does still today is a very, very important accomplishment. Last time I was but the learner, now I am the master. Only a master of evil, Darth. 
If you strike me down, I shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. And of course, as you know, Kenobi gives his life. He becomes the spirit Kenobi. He can help Luke and give him advice through cryptic voice messages and the TIE fighter scene that follows. The film never lets up. Come on, kid, we're not out of this yet. Oh, man, I love Star Wars. Now, in regards to the changes the special edition made, really the only scene that I feel had any place in this movie is the introduction to Big's Dark Lighter that occurs just before the Death Star attack sequence. Luke runs into his old friend Biggs and have a brief conversation. You get the sense of camaraderie. You get the sense that they grew up together. And when Biggs eventually dies, it feels more powerful. That's the only special edition change that I feel is actually Good. And of course, the Death Star sequence is fucking brilliant filmmaking. It's revolutionary in all regards. It still holds up visually. It's extremely exciting. John Williams' score, I will play that sometimes when I'm driving on the highway. Not a good idea. Han swooping in at the last second. Yeehoo! And then like Tarkin's face like this right before it blows up. It's so intense. It's such a great moment. I love the original Star Wars film. The eventual throne sequence is incredibly important to the film with the music and everything, but I'm smiling because I should probably tell you guys, uh, I walked down the aisle at my wedding to the throne room music from Star Wars. That's a true statement, and I love the fact that my wife was into that too. So yes, uh, Star Wars has had a humongous impact on my life. One quick thought, I've always wondered why Wedge wasn't included in the metal scene. What about Wedge? You know, I mean, give him a give him an award. He did a good thing. Give him an award. Star Wars is absolutely iconic filmmaking. When you take into account everything that was going wrong with the production, all of the people that George Lucas had to convince that he was making something good, including his own crew and actors, not just studio heads. The fact that a studio just gave George Lucas all rights to sequels without even giving a shit tells you how few people actually cared about this movie. And still to this day is one of the greatest and most impactful films ever made. It has inspired countless individuals, including the guy talking to you right now. And of course, Star Wars gets an A+. Guys, I'm so glad to be talking to you about these movies. I switched up my background specifically for this review. I hope you guys enjoyed that. And I also want to give a big thanks to my buddy, Matthew Brando. He provided the Moss Eisley Lego set that I used for this opening. I've left a link for his channel below. He does toy reviews. He loves Jurassic Park, as well as Star Wars and Aliens. And he has a great channel. I want to give him a big thank you. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I'll be returning next month to talk about The Empire Strikes Back. Guys, thank you once again. And if you like this, you can click right here and get stuck -manized.